offering our love, protection, and respect to everyone, regardless of our personal feelings toward any individual. Every member has a part in the development of group conscience. We are all equal in the expression of a conscious contact with a higher power of our understanding. 64. Tradition to offer guidance for our relationships with others. Thy loving higher power is the source of direction for now as a whole. This higher power is also the source of the principle that we apply when we serve. We can use this principle when we seek direction as individuals, groups, service boards, or committees. Service is for those we serve. Our best Talent in service is the ability to reach other ethics, offer identification and welcome. Greet the addict walking in the door for the first time, and help ensure that newcomers return again and again. Any one of us is capable of offering that service. With the guidance of a loving higher power, we become better able to help others. Service to the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous has its own rewards. When we practice spiritual principles in our daily lives, a stronger relationship with our higher power develops. Our relationship with our group and the fellowship grows stronger. Two. Service in now is a learning experience that allows us personal growth. We begin to look beyond our own interests, setting aside our self-centered view of life in order to better serve the whole. We benefit spiritually in return for our unselfish service. Tradition 3. Liu Shu. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop using. Narcotics Anonymous offers recovery to addicts around the world. We focus on the disease of addiction rather than any particular drug. Our message is broad enough to attract addicts from any social class or nationality. When new members come to meetings, our sole interest is in their desire for freedom from active addiction and how we can be of help. The third tradition helps now offer recovery to so many addicts by freeing us from having to make judgments about prospective members. It eliminates the need for membership committees or applications. We are not asked to make decisions about anyone's fitness for recovery. Since the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop using, we as members have no reason to judge each other. Desire is not a measurable commodity. It lives in the heart of each individual member. Because we can't judge the sole requirement for membership, we are encouraged to open wide the doors of our meetings to any addict who wishes to join. We are asked to accept and to others the care and concern that 
Kofi Shalas Kunze Sense of Feeling. The so tradition goes now grow by encouraging us to welcome others. Membership is a personal decision reached by each individual. We can do a lot to allow addicts the freedom to make that decision and reaffirm their commitment to recovery. We can help them feel comfortable in our groups by greeting them at the door, sharing with other addicts before or after the meeting, and exchanging telephone numbers. We try to make sure that any addict who attends our meeting is not turned away. To the extent that it's possible, we choose the most accessible location for our meetings. We may choose a format that reflects an invitational term. Most of all, we encourage every edit to keep coming back. The strength of any member's desire is not necessarily connected to any outside circumstance. What makes one addict stick clean while another returns to using? No one of us can just use stick to recover and to be returned to active addiction. There are no guarantees based on types of drugs used or using history. We cannot predict a higher success rate for addicts of a certain age, or those who use for a certain number of years, or women over men, or any other external factor. Just as we are not capable of measuring another's desire to stay clean, neither are we equipped to decide who should join. We are free to offer welcome instead of judgment. We look for ways to help instead of judge. Our task is to find the flame of desire, not dampen it. Any addict who walks into a meeting, even a using addict, displays a level of willingness that cannot be discounted. While maintaining an emphasis on the importance of total abstinence, so using addicts are welcome into our meetings with special encouragement to keep coming back. Many recovering addicts do not have access to regular meetings because of incarceration, geography, physical disability, or employment. These addicts are members in every respect as long as they have the desire to stop using and they are entitled to the same consideration and support as any other member. Addicts attend their first meeting for many reasons. Our motives for coming to now aren't particularly important. The desire to stop using may not be clearly realized. It may be no more than a subtle yearning for relief from pain. But that yearning often drives us to seek solutions we might otherwise never consider. Often the experience of hearing other addicts share about Liu Shi Liu. Recovery reignite the desire to stop using. Others come to a meeting, hear the message, and return to active addiction. 
close call return to meet his for relapse often saying their desire to stop using was born from the pain of relapse. We come to now for many reasons. But we speak to recover when we find and keep the desire to stop using. The group is not the jury of desire. We cannot measure or arbitrate willingness. Any addict's willingness to come to a meeting ought to be a sufficient indication of desire. It may take a while for an addict to find the desire that we keep for or we mean narcotics anonymous. No addict should be denied an opportunity to stay long enough to develop that desire. We can nurture that desire with loving acceptance. The wording of the third tradition reflects the broad focus of our first step. It's written simply enough to include addicts of all countries and cultures, no matter what drugs they use. Before finding recovery in LA, many addicts don't think that alcohol is a problem. Others abuse prescription medication, thinking that legal drugs are okay. Because of the wording of this tradition, we are able to attract and welcome addicts who might think they didn't use the right drugs to qualify for membership in now. Each addict should be allowed to decide if now is the answer for being more herself. We cannot make the decision for others. Although the third tradition is written simply, we know that when it talks about a desire to stop using, it means using drugs. We understand that now is a program of recovery for drug addicts. Although addiction takes on a broader meaning for many of us as we continue in recovery, it's important to remember that we first came to not because of our drug problems. If new members are to feel that they belong in NA, they need to hear something they can identify with. They find that identification in the Fellowship of Recovery Addicts in Narcotics Anonymous. Many of us know when we walk into our first meeting that we're addicts. It's not something we have to decide, it's just a fact of life. Membership, however, means more than just being an addict, it means making a decision. If we identify with what we hear in NA and relate with the people we meet, we will want what now offers. So long as we have a desire to stop using, we are free to make the decision to join Narcotics Anonymous. Then, once we've made that decision, we need to follow it with a commitment to the principles of now. With that commitment, we set ourselves scurrying on the road of recovery, applying spiritual principles. The third tradition encourages freedom from judgment. It leads us on the path of service toward an attitude of helpfulness, acceptance, and unconditional love. As we've seen in the previous traditions, 
our pet of service arises from the application of principles. Some of the principles that support this tradition include tolerance, compassion, anonymity, and humility. Tolerance reminds us that judgment is not our task. The disease of addiction does not exclude anyone. Nah, likewise, cannot exclude any addict who desires to stop using. We learn to be tolerant of addicts from different backgrounds than ours. Remembering that we are not better than any other addict in a meeting. Addiction is a deadly disease. We know that addicts who don't find recovery can expect nothing better than jails, institutions, and death. Refusing admission to any addict even one who comes merely out of curiosity may be a death sentence for that addict. We learn to practice tolerance of addicts who don't look like us, think like us, or share like us. We teach by example, pressuring, Liu Shi Qi, new members to tap or act like we do may send them back to the streets. It certainly denies them the right to recover and learn in their own way. Compassion lends kindness to all our efforts in service to others. With compassion as the foundation of our actions, we learn to support members through any difficulties they may experience. All too often, we are quick to judge the quality of another's recovery or willingness. Tradition 3 asks us to set aside our self-righteousness. Because the only requirement for membership is a quality we cannot measure. The right to judge another's desire is denied us. Our attitude ought to be one of loving acceptance toward all addicts. No man will she will she No man. RKS, R and Y. The 12 steps and 12 traditions of Narcotics Anonymous. Contents are Introduction. Book 1 Step 1 Step 2 Step 3 Step 4 Step 5 Step 6 Step 7 Step 8 Step 9 Step 10 Step 11 Step 12 Book 2 The 12 Traditions Tradition 1 Applying Spiritual Principles Tradition 2 Applying Spiritual Principles Tradition 3 Applying Spiritual Principles Tradition 4 Applying Spiritual Principles Tradition 5 Applying Spiritual Principles Tradition 6 Applying Spiritual Principles Tradition 7 Applying Spiritual Principles Tradition 8 Applying Spiritual Principles Tradition 9 Applying Spiritual Principles Tradition 10 Applying Spiritual Principles Tradition 11 Applying Spiritual Principles Tradition 12 Introduction Sun Welcome 
Look up you can your friends is a discussion of the 12 steps and 12 traditions of Narcotics Anonymous. We realize that what are written or verbal, no discussion of something as personal and individual as recovery can be all things to all people. This book is not meant to be an exhaustive study of last steps and traditions, nor is it meant to be the final word on any aspect of recovery or non-unity. Rather, it is meant to help you determine your own interpretation of the principles contained in our steps and traditions. We hope you will find personal growth, understanding, and empathy in the following pages. We pray you will be moved to a new level of insight into your recovery and the valuable place you occupy as a member of Narcotics Anonymous. Each member of NAC has contributed to this book in some way. Whether you are new to recovery or one of our longtime members, your experience, your support, and, above all, your presence in the rooms where addicts need to share recovery have been the motivating forces behind the production of this book. Though the process of writing a book about the experience of a fellowship as diverse as ours has been lengthy, we saw all the barriers and stumbling blocks fade away in the light of our primary purpose to carry the message to the still suffering addict. Let one purpose, clear and powerful, stands alone in our collective consciousness as the only thing that really matters. With that, all is possible and miracles happen. The nature of the recovery process gave us the title for this book. After all was said and done, one fundamental truth emerged as the crux of our program. It works. The reasons our program works the how and why of recovery are found in many places, in each other, in our relationship with a higher power, in our hearts and minds, and finally, in the collective wisdom of our members. Because our principal endeavor in the development of this book has been to capture that collective wisdom in written form, we believe the title of this book is most appropriate. It works how and why. We pray that this book fully represents the therapeutic value of one addict helping another. We offer this book as a gift, addict to addict, and hope our love and concern for every addict who is staying our way of life comes across as strongly as we feel it. Please use and enjoy this book. Share it with your friends, your sponsor, and the people you sponsor. After all, it is through sharing with each other that we find our own answers, our own higher power, and our own path of recovery. So, book one. The 12 Steps
the purpose of this portion of the book is to invite members to engage in a journey of recovery and to serve as a resource in gaining a personal understanding of the spiritual principles in the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous. This portion of the book explores the spiritual principle in each step and how we experience them in our lives. We believe that the steps are presented in a manner that encompasses the diversity of our fellowship and is reflective of the spiritual awakening described in our 12th step. Step 1. We admitted that we were powerless over our addiction. That our lives had become unmanageable. As addicts, we have each experienced the pain, loneliness, and the stir of addiction. Before coming to NA, most of us tried everything we could think of to control our use of drugs. We tried switching drugs, thinking that we only had a problem with one particular drug. We tried limiting our drug use to certain times or places. We may even have what to stop using altogether at a certain point. We may have told ourselves we would never do the things we watched other addicts do, then found ourselves doing those very things. Nothing we tried had any less been effective. Our active addiction continued to progress, overpowering even our best intentions. Alone, terrified of what the future held for us, we found the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. As members of Narcotics Anonymous, our experience is that addiction is a progressive disease. The progression may be rapid or slow, but it is always downhill. As long as we are using drugs, our lives will steadily get worse. It will be impossible to precisely describe addiction in a way that is agreeable to everyone. However, the disease seems to affect us in the following general ways. Mentally, we become obsessed with the of using. Physically, we develop a compulsion to continue using, regardless of the consequences. Spiritually, we become totally self-centered in the course of our addiction. Looking at addiction as a disease makes sense to a lot of addicts because, in our experience, Addiction is progressive, incurable, and can be fatal unless arrested. In Narcotics Anonymous, we deal with every aspect of our addiction, not just its most obvious symptom, our uncontrollable drug use. The aspects of our disease are numerous. By practicing this program, we each discover the ways in which our addiction affects us personally. Regardless of the individual effects of addiction on our lives, all of us share some common characteristics. Towarding the first step we will address the obsession, 
the compulsion, the denial, and lock many have from the spiritual life. As we examine and acknowledge all these aspects of our thesis, we start to understand our powerlessness. Many of us have had problems with the idea that, as addicts, we are obsessive and compulsive. The idea that these words applied to us may have made us green. However, obsession and compulsion are aspects of our powerlessness. We need to understand and acknowledge their presence in our lives if our admission of powerlessness is to be complete. Obsession, for us, is the never-ending stream of sex relating to using drugs, running out of drugs, getting more drugs, and so on. We simply can't get this stress out of our minds. In our experience, compulsion is the irrational impulse to continue using drugs, no matter what happens as a result. We just can't stop. We address obsession and compulsion fear as they relate to our drug use because when we first come into the program, our drug addiction is how we identify with each other and the program. As we continue in our recovery, we will see how these aspects of our addiction can manifest in many areas of our lives. Denial is the part of our disease that makes it difficult, if not impossible, for us to acknowledge reality. In our addiction, denial protected us from seeing the reality of what our lives have become. We often tell ourselves that, given the right set of circumstances, we might still be able, still, to bring our lives under control. Always skillful at defending our actions, we refuse to accept responsibility for the damage done by our addiction. We believe that if we tried long and tall enough, substituted one drug for another, switch friends, or change our living arrangements or occupations, our lives will improve. These rationalizations repeatedly fail us, yet we continue to cling to them. We denied that we had a problem with drugs, regardless of all evidence to the contrary. We lied to ourselves, believing that we could use again successfully. We justified our actions, despite the wreckage around us resulting from our addiction. The spiritual part of our disease, the part we may recognize only by a feeling of emptiness or loneliness when we first get clean, is perhaps one of the most difficult aspects of addiction for us. Because this part of our disease affects us so profoundly and so personally, we may be overwhelmed when we think about applying a program of recovery to it. However, we need to keep in mind that recovery doesn't happen overnight for anyone. As 
please have to look at the effects of our disease. We are sure to see that our legs have become unmanageable. We see it in all the things that are wrong with our lives. Look at our experiences are individual and very widely from addict to addict. Some of us realized our lives had become unmanageable because we felt out of control emotionally or began to feel deeply about our drug use. Some of us have lost everything our homes, our families, our jobs, and our self-respect. Some of us never learned how to function as human beings at all. Some of us have spent time in jails and institutions. And some of us have come very close to death. Whatever our individual circumstances, our lives have been governed by obsessive, compulsive, behavior, and the end result has been unmanageability. Perhaps we arrive in now without recognizing the problems we had for what they were. Because of our self-centeredness, we were often the last ones to realize that we were addicts. Many of us are persuaded by friends or family to begin attending the meetings. Other members receive even stronger encouragement from the cause. No matter how it occurred, our long-standing illusions had to be shattered. Honestly, had to replace denial before we could face the truth of our addiction. Many of us recall the moment of clarity when we came face to face with our disease. All the lies, all the pretenses, all the rationalizations we had used to justify where we stood as a result of our drug use stop working. Who and what we were becomes more clear. We could no longer avoid the truth. We have found that we cannot recover without the ability to be honest. Many of us came to now after spending years practicing dishonesty. However, we can learn to be honest, and we must begin to try. Learning to be honest is an ongoing process. We are able to become progressively more honest as we work the steps and continue to stay clean. In the first step, we begin to practice the spiritual principle of honesty by admitting the truth about our drug use. Then we go on to admit the truth about our lives. We face what is, not the way things could be or should be. It doesn't matter where we come from or how good or bad we think we get it. When we finally turn to Narcotics Anonymous and the 12 steps, we begin to find relief. As we begin working the first step, it is important to ask ourselves some basic personal questions. Can I control my use of drugs? Am I willing to stop using? Am I willing to do whatever it takes to recover? Given a choice between finding a new way of life in NA and continuing in our addiction, recovery begins 
to appeal to us. T. We will be to let go of our reservations. Let's pass on ourselves. We won't surrender to the program. Most of us do have some reservations when we first get clean. Even so, we need to find ways of addressing them. Reservations can be anything. I believe that because we never had a problem with one particular drug. We can still use it, placing a condition on our recovery, such as only staying clean as long as our expectations are met. I believe that we can still be involved with the people associated with our addiction. I believe that we can use when after a certain amount of time clean, a conscious or unconscious decision to work only certain steps. With the help of other recovering addicts, we can find ways to put our reservations behind us. The most important thing for us to know about reservations is that by keeping them, we are reserving a place in our program for relapse. Recovery begins when we start to apply the spiritual principles contained in the 12 steps of not to all areas of our lives. We realize, however, that we cannot begin this process unless we stop using drugs. Total abstinence from all drugs is the only way we can begin to overcome our addiction. While abstinence is the beginning, our only hope for recovery is a profound emotional and spiritual change. Our experience shows that it is necessary for us to be willing to do anything it takes to obtain this precious gift of recovery. In recovery, we will be introduced to spiritual principles such as the surrender, honesty, and acceptance required for the first step. If we faithfully practice these principles, they will transform our perceptions and the way we live our lives. When we first begin to practice these principles, they may seem very unnatural to us. It may take a deliberate effort on our part to make the honest admission called for in step one. Even though we are admitting our addiction, we may still wonder if this program will really work. Acceptance of our addiction is something that goes beyond our conscious admission. When we accept our addiction, we gain the hope of recovery. We begin to believe on a deep level that we, too, can recover. We begin to let go of our doubts and truly come to terms with our disease. We become open to change. We surrender. As we work the first step, we find that surrender is not what we thought it was. In the past, we probably thought of surrender as something that only we can hardly people need. We saw only two choices, 
either keep fighting to control or using or just hanging completely and let our lives fall to pieces. We felt we were in a battle to control our using and let, if we surrendered, the dogs would win. In recovery, we find that surrender involves letting go of our reservations about recovery and being willing to try a different approach to living life. The process of Surrender is extremely personal for each one of us. Only we, as individuals, know when we die it. We stress the importance of surrender, for it is the very process that enables us to recover. When we surrender, we know in our hearts that we've had enough. We're tired of fighting. A relief comes over us as we finally realize that the struggle is over. No matter how hard we fought, we finally reached the point of surrender where we realize that we couldn't stop using drugs on our own. We were able to admit our powerlessness over our addiction. We gave up completely. Even though we didn't know exactly what would happen, we gathered up our courage and admitted our powerlessness. We gave up the illusion that we could control our using thereby opening the door to recovery. Many of us begin the process of surrender when we identify ourselves at and now meeting with our name and the words, I am an addict. Once we admit that we are addicts and that we cannot stop using on our own, we are able to stay clean on a daily basis with the help of others. Ba! Recovering addicts in Narcotics Anonymous The paradox of this admission is evident once we work the first step. As long as we think we can control our drug use, we are almost forced to continue. The minute we admit we're powerless, we never have to use again. This reprieve from having to use is the most profound gift we can receive, for it saves our lives. Through our collective experience, we have found that we can accomplish together what we cannot do alone. It is necessary for us to seek help from other recovering addicts. As we attend meetings regularly, we can find great comfort in the experiences of those traveling this path with us. Coming to NAP has been described by many members as coming home. We find ourselves welcomed and accepted by other recovering addicts. We finally find a place where we belong. Though we are sure to be helped by the sharing we hear at meetings, we need to find a sponsor to help us in our recovery. Beginning with the first step, a sponsor can share with us his or her own experience with the steps. Listening to our sponsor's experience and applying it to our own lives is how we take advantage of one of the most beautiful and practical aspects of recovery.
the therapeutic value of one addict helping another. We fear in our meetings that I can't, but we can. Actively working with a sponsor will give us some first-hand experience with this. Through our developing relationship with our sponsor, we learn about the principle of trust. By following the suggestions of our sponsor instead of only our own ideas, we learn the principles of open-mindedness and willingness. Our sponsor will help us work the steps of recovery. Talking honestly with our sponsor about our drug use and how it affected our lives will help us work the first step slowly. We need always remember where we came from and where our addiction took us. We have only a daily reprieve from our active addiction. Each day, we accept the fact that we cannot use drugs successfully. The process of recovery isn't easy. It takes great courage and perseverance to continue in recovery day after day. Part of the recovery process is to move forward in spite of whatever may stand in our way. Because long-lasting change in recovery happens slowly, we will turn to the first step again and again. Even long periods of abstinence not guarantee us continued freedom from the pain and trouble that addiction can bring. The symptoms of our disease can always return. We may find that we are powerless in ways we never imagined. This is where we begin to understand how the things we tried so hard to control are in reality, completely beyond our control. No matter how our disease displays itself, we must take its deadly nature into account. As we do, we develop a fuller awareness of the nature of our disease. The disease of addiction can manifest itself in a variety of mental obsessions and compulsive actions that have nothing to do with drugs. We sometimes find ourselves obsessed and behaving compulsively over things we may never have had problems with until we stopped using drugs. We may once again try to fill the awful emptiness we sometimes feel with something upside ourselves. Anytime we find ourselves using something to change the way we feel, we need to apply the principles of the first step. We are never immune from having our lives become unmanageable, even after years of recovery. If problems pile up and our resources for coping with them bring them, we may feel out of control and in too much pain to do anything constructive for ourselves. We feel overwhelmed by life. And that feeling seems to make everything worse. When our lives seem to be falling apart, we reapply ourselves to the basics of the NAR program. We stay in close contact with our chill sponsor, work the steps, and go to meetings. We surrender again. 
knowing that with curry lies in the admission of the faith. The feeling of love and acceptance we find in the fellowship of narcotics anonymous allows us to fulfill recovering from our addiction. We learn a new way to live. The emptiness from which we suffer this seems to working and living the 12 steps. We learn that our addiction is being addressed in all its complexity by this simple program. We have found a solution to our hopelessness. There is a deeply spiritual nature to our program of recovery. The 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous will take us on a journey that will far exceed our expectations. Working and living the steps will lead us to a spiritual awakening. Step 1 is the beginning of this spiritual journey. To get started on this journey, we must become willing to surrender to this program and its principles. For our future features on our willingness to grow spiritually. We are starting a new way of life, one that offers great joy and happiness. However, recovery doesn't exempt us from pain. Living life on life's terms combines moments of happiness with moments of sadness. Wonderful events are mixed with painful ones. We will experience a full range of feelings about the events in our lives. By honestly looking at what we have become in our addiction, we recognize the powerlessness and unmanageability of our lives. Moving beyond our reservations, we accept our addiction, surrender, and experience the hope that recovery offers. We realize that we can no longer go on as we have been. We are ready for a change. We are willing to try another way. With our willingness, we move on to step two. Step two. She. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Our surrender in the first step leaves us with a deep need to believe that we can recover. This surrender makes it possible for us to feel hope. By admitting our own powerlessness, we open our minds to an entirely new idea. The possibility that something greater than ourselves might be powerful enough to relieve our obsession to use drugs. It is quite likely that, before coming to NA, we never believe in any power but our own willpower, and that that failed us. They introduces us to a new understanding. We draw hope from this understanding and begin to comprehend what it means to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. We find additional hope by listening to other recovery addicts. We can relate to where they've been and the hope from who they've become. We listen closely at meetings and become willing to apply what we think to our own lives. As we begin to believe that there is hope for us, 
We also booking to trust the process of recovery. Our white book of space. There is one thing more than anything else that will defeat us in our recovery. This is an attitude of indifference or intolerance towards spiritual principles. Three of these that are indispensable are honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. This doesn't mean we must be unfailingly honest, open-minded, and willing. We just have to try as best we can to practice these principles. As we first approach step 2, we can practice the principle of honesty by acknowledging and sharing what we do or don't believe about a power greater than ourselves. Developing our open-mindedness requires some effort, but we can practice this principle by listening to other recovering addicts share how they came to believe. For many of us, the willingness to try something new came about simply because we were so tired of our old ways. It seemed to us that, because our own power wasn't sufficient to restore our sanity, perhaps something else could, if we let it. Many of us felt that insanity was too hard a word to describe our condition. However, if we take a realistic look at our active addiction, we'll see that we have been anything but sane. For the most part, our perceptions were not based in reality. We viewed the world around us as a hostile environment. Some of us withdrew physically and had little if any, contact with anyone. Some of us went through the motions of life but a lot nothing to touch us emotionally. Either way, we ended up feeling isolated. Despite evidence to the contrary we felt that we were in control. We ignored or didn't believe the truths that were staring us in the face. We continued to do the same things and expected the results to be different. Worst of all was the fact that we continued to use drugs, regardless of the negative consequences we experienced. Despite the warning signs that our drug use was out of control, we continued trying to justify it. All too often, the result was that we could no longer face ourselves. When we take a realistic look at our lives, there can be no doubt that we desperately need a restoration to sanity. Regardless of our individual interpretation of the term restoration, most of us agree that, for us, it means changing to a point where addiction and its accompanying insanity are not controlling our lives. Being restored to sanity is a lifelong process. Individually, we experience it differently at varying stages of our recovery but we all can see some results of this process right from the beginning of our recovery. Initially, being restored to sanity means 
that we no longer have to use drugs. We go to meetings rather than isolating. We call our sponsor rather than sitting alone with painful feelings. We ask for our sponsor's guidance in working with us. Direct demonstration of she sanity. We begin to believe that a powerful force can restore us to sanity. At long last, we feel hope for ourselves. We came to believe in quite a process. For some, this process is simple, and it may bring immediate results. Many of us arrived in now so completely defeated that we were willing to try anything. Seeking help from a power greater than ourselves may have been the best idea we had ever heard. However, the process of coming to believe can be difficult, even painful. Many of us have found that acting as if we believe is helpful. This does not mean we should be dishonest. Rather, it means that if we have doubts, we practice the program as if we believe we can be restored to sanity. Believing a power greater than ourselves does not come easily to all of us. However, we have found an open mind indispensable when we approach this step. If we look around us, we find many reasons to believe. Our belief may simply be that we can recover from a life of active addiction. The freedom from the obsession to use may be our first experience of a power greater than ourselves at work in our lives. Perhaps for the first time in many years, our obsession with drugs no longer controls our every waking moment. Knowing that we don't have to use today is a powerful belief in and of itself. With how to develop faith through the process of coming to believe. It starts with hope. For some of us, this may be only a faint spark at first, perhaps just the thought that maybe, if we work this program, our lives will get better. Our hope turns to this as our lives begin to improve. For many of us, this can be described as a belief in something intangible. After all, who can logically explain the sudden lifting of an obsession to use drugs? Yet this has happened for many of us. With our hope for a different life and the beginnings of our faith that recovery is possible, we start the process of coming to believe in a power greater than ourselves. We come from various walks of life and experience, so it is natural that we bring with us differing concepts of spirituality. In NA, no one is forced to believe any set ideas. Each one of us can believe in anything in which we want to believe. This is a spiritual program, not a religion. Individually, we cultivate our own beliefs about a power greater than we are. No 
matter what we understand, his heart to be. Hell is available to us all. In the beginning, many of us turned to the group or the love we encounter in Narcotics Anonymous as our higher power. And now group is a powerful example of a power greater than ourselves at work. Often in desperation, we enter a room full of addicts who share their experience, strength, and hope with us. As we listen, we know with certainty that they have felt the hopelessness and remorse from which we, too, have suffered. As we observe other addicts practicing a new way of life without the use of drugs, we may come to believe that we, too, can recover. Watching other addicts quickly is telling proof of the existence of a power greater than ourselves. We notice the acceptance that recovering addicts show each other. We watch as addicts celebrate. Less of clean time that we think will be impossible for us to attain. Perhaps someone hugs us and tells us to keep coming back. Members give us their phone numbers. We feel the power of the group. And this helps us start to heal. Many of us use spiritual principles as a power greater than ourselves. We come to believe that by practicing this principle in our lives, we can be restored to sanity. This makes sense to us because we have tried many times to sink ourselves into a better way of life. We usually have good intentions, but our day-to-day -day existence really measured up to those intentions. Trying it, sure. The other way, practicing a better way of life by living according to spiritual principles will eventually have an effect on our thinking. It is not necessary that we define for ourselves the entire concept of a power greater than ourselves. Those of us with many years of recovery find that our understanding of a higher power changes over time. Our belief grows, as does our faith. We come to believe in a power which can help us far more than we originally thought. As we search for understanding of a higher power, we can talk with our sponsor and other recovering addicts. We may ask them what their idea of a higher power is and how they have arrived at it. This may open our minds to possibilities we hadn't considered before. While it is useful to question others about their spiritual beliefs, we must remember that our understanding of a power greater than ourselves is up to each individual. Others can help us. We may even adopt the ideas of someone else for a while or just believe that they believe. Eventually, however, we need to come to believe for ourselves. The need for our own self.
essence of spirituality is too vital to our recovery for us to neglect this highly personal process. For us, part of the process of coming to believe is accepting the evidence we see. Our addiction caused us to deny the truth we saw. But now, in recovery we can believe what we see. At first, we open our minds and try something new. Somehow believing that what we try might work. After we take a few small steps toward belief and trust and see results, we become willing to take bigger steps. We find that we are no longer acting as if we believe. Our belief is now reinforced with our own personal experience, some of which is unexplainable. We sometimes encounter remarkable coincidences in our lives that have no rational explanation. We don't need to explain or analyze these occurrences. We can simply accept that they happen and be grateful for them. The longer we stay clean, the more evident it becomes that our addiction goes much deeper than the drugs we use. Much of our problem seems to center in our search for something to make us feel whole. It is a tremendous struggle to stop relying on our own reasoning and ask for help, especially given the self-centered nature of our disease. However, we are becoming open-minded in realizing that we don't have all the answers. We begin to find some humility. We may not grasp the full impact of what being humble means, but our open-mindedness assures us that we have found and have begun to demonstrate this valuable quality. Our humility and open-mindedness make us teachable. We allow others to share what has worked for them. This takes humility, for we must let go of our fears about how we may appear to others. Some of the strongest suggestions we may receive from other addicts are to attend meetings, ask for help, pray, and work the steps. Our experience has shown us that belief in a higher power leads us toward recovery in Narcotics Anonymous. People tend to live what they believe, and our newfound belief calls on us to live the program. No matter what we choose for our personal higher power, we've come to believe that now works. We live what we believe by continuing on our path of recovery and working the 12 steps to the best of our ability. Even after years clean, when we have been working a program of recovery and seeking change, we may at times experience periods when life seems meaningless. We may experience a sense of alienation too painful to ignore. At such times, we may find ourselves moving away from sanity, not toward it. We may begin to question our commitment to recovery. We can become obsessed with self-destructive facts 
we may be urge to fall back on what seems easier, the familiar voice of our addiction. During these times, we need to renew our commitment to recovery. We trust that we are undergoing a fundamental transformation, even though we may. She said, not yet understand its full implication for our lives. During these days, relying on the second stick provides us with hope and remains us thought we are not alone. If things don't feel right, we take time to think and seek suggestions from our sponsor. We trust thought with help from other recovering addicts and a power greater than our service. We can the restore it to sanity in all areas of our lives. We draw upon what we have learned from going to meetings and following direction. We accept that life on life's terms may not always be to our making or, more importantly, to our understanding, sanity often means that we don't act on our first impulse. We begin to make choices that help us rather than harm us. What worked for us in the beginning remains applicable. No matter how many years we have been playing, once again, we have the OS of the basics of this program. Going to meetings, reacting out for help, and then... US. Along with the hope that derived from working step two, the sign that our way of thinking is undergoing a radical change, the whole world looks different, where before they had no reason to hope, they now have every reason to expect a dramatic difference in our life, the being open needed, has opened ourselves to new ideas that step away from the problem and toward a spiritual solution. This solution is evidenced by our open-mindedness and our willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves. We must now go on to step 3 to develop a relationship with the God of our understanding. Step 3. 14. We made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. The surrender we experience in step 1, coupled with the hope and belief we find in step 2, make us ready and willing to continue on the path toward freedom in Narcotics Anonymous. In step 3, we put our belief in a higher power into action, making a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of the God of our understanding. Essential to working the third step is our willingness to allow the God of our understanding to work in our lives. We develop this willingness over time. The willingness we experience in our early recovery is valuable even though we may be willing only to a certain degree. Although this may feel like unconditional willingness, many of us have discovered that our willingness grew as we learned to trust a power greater than ourselves. The decision we make in step 3 requires that we move away from our self-will. Self-will is composed of such characteristics as closed-mindedness, unwillingness, self-centeredness, and outright defiance. Our self-centered obsession and its accompanying insanity have made our lives unmanageable. 
Acting on ourselves will has kept us trapped in a continuous cycle of fear and pain. We wore ourselves out in fruitless attempts to control everyone and everything. We couldn't just allow events to happen. We were always on the lookout for ways we could force things to go as we wanted. When we first look at making the decision called for in this step, we are likely to have questions, uncertainty, and even fear about what we are being asked to do. We might wonder why we need to make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of the God of our understanding. Or we may wonder what will happen to us if we place ourselves in God's care. We may fear that we won't be happy with what our lives will be like after working this step. When we trust that there is growth in taking action despite our fear or uncertainty, we are able to work step 3. Even though we do not know how our lives will change as we work this step, we can learn to trust that our higher power will care for us better than we could. The third step is our commitment to our own emotional, physical, and spiritual well-being. What began in the second step is belief in a higher power can become a fuller relationship with a God of our understanding in step 3. The decision that we make by working this step, and the relationship that results, will revolutionize our existence. This decision is easier to make than to live by. We can easily lapse into old behavior, it takes determination, time, and courage to change. Because we're not perfect, we simply continue to reaffirm our decision on a regular basis and then do the very best we can to live by it. Complete and unconditional surrender of our will and our lives is an ideal we strive to fulfill. Although we don't become perfect, we do make a profound change by working this step. We are making a serious effort to live differently than we have in the past. From now on, we are going to be practicing this decision, and the way we relate to the world around us can change radically as a result. In working step 3, we begin to learn how to stop struggling. We learn to let go and trust the God of our understanding. If we take time to think and seek direction before acting, we no longer have to run on our own self-centered will. Turning our will and our lives over to the care of our 15. Higher power provides a solution to the problems created by a life based in self-will, resentment, and control. The spiritual principles we are practicing will guide us, not just in the third step but throughout our recovery. The first three steps provide us with the solid spiritual foundation we will need to work the rest of the steps. We keep our initial surrender alive by actively practicing the faith and willingness required to work the third step. In other words, we've admitted our powerlessness and inability to manage our own lives. We've come to believe, now we need to surrender to the care of the God of our understanding. We may find the willingness to work the third step by remembering where we came from and believing that where we are going is certain to be quite different. Though we don't know what this difference will entail, we know that it is sure to be better than what we've had in the past. We rely on our faith and believe that this decision is one of the best decisions we've ever made. Turning our will and our lives over to the care of the God of our understanding is a tremendous decision. We may very well wonder exactly how we are supposed to put this decision into practice. Because our individual beliefs about a power greater than ourselves vary, there is no uniform way to put our decision into action. 
However, we have found some ways we all can use to find a personal understanding of the third step. One is to continue our efforts to develop a personal relationship with a God of our understanding. Another is to give up our efforts at controlling everything around us. We relax our grip on the burdens we've been carrying and turn them over to the care of a higher power. Yet another way we can practice our third step decision is to continue with our recovery by working the remainder of the steps. Our sponsor will guide us in applying the spiritual principles of recovery, showing us how to shift our focus away from our own self-interest and toward a more spiritually centered life. As we get ready to make this decision, we talk with our sponsor, go to step meetings, and take the opportunity to share about it with other non-members. We gather as much knowledge, insight, and experience as we can from these sources, and then we make our own decision. No one can do it for us. We must consciously decide to do this for ourselves. Of course, this is not a decision we make solely with our intellect. In truth, this is a choice we make with our hearts, a decision based much more in feeling and desire than in deliberate reasoning. Though the path from mind to heart seems a difficult one, formally working this step with our sponsor seems to help us make this decision a part of who we are. The search for a God of our own understanding is one of the most important efforts we will undertake in our recovery. We have complete personal choice and freedom in how we understand our higher power. We can each find a higher power that does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Because we are powerless over our addict ion, we need a power greater than ourselves to help us. Just as our freedom to have a God of our own understanding is unlimited, so is our freedom to communicate with our higher power in whatever ways work for us. Anytime we communicate with our higher power, whether it's simply with our thoughts or aloud at the close of a meeting, we are praying. Most of us ask our higher power for direction on a daily basis. Our relationship with our higher power grows stronger as we practice faith. In our experience, talking to a power greater than ourselves works. When we are having trouble in a particular area of our lives or when we feel unable to stay clean, our higher power can help, we only need to. 16. Ask. With our prayers, we ask a power greater than ourselves to care for us. Each time we take this action, we strengthen our faith and our decision to rely on our higher power. Step 3 doesn't free us from having to take action, but it does liberate us from excessive worry about the results. If we want something, a job, an education, recovery, we have to make the effort to get it. Our higher power will take care of our spiritual needs, but we need to participate in our own lives. We can't simply sit back and expect God to do everything. We are responsible for our recovery. Our lives are meant to be lived. No matter how sincere our efforts at turning it over, we will make mistakes, wander off course, and experience moments of doubt. However, with each setback we are given a new opportunity to renew our commitment to live by spiritual principles. Part of the process of surrendering to God's will is to surrender to spiritual principles such as honesty, open-mindedness, willingness, trust, and faith. We try to align our actions with what we believe our higher power would want for us, and then we deal with life as it happens.
We may hesitate to work step 3 in all areas of our lives, especially in matters we want to control. Our experience has been that we tend to hold on to certain areas. Perhaps we think, I can control my finances just fine, or, my relationship is working, why do I need to turn that over to the care of my higher power? Working step 3 only in certain areas of our lives short circuits our spiritual development. We have found that our recovery benefits when we practice the principle of surrender, to the best of our ability, in all areas of our lives. We strive to work this step thoroughly. We begin to see positive results from the decision we have made. We begin to notice changes. While the circumstances of our lives may not change, the way we deal with those circumstances does. Because we have made the decision to allow spiritual principles to work in our lives, we may notice a sense of relief. We are being relieved of a burden we've carried far too long, the need to control everything and everyone. We begin to react differently to the situations and people around us. As we gain acceptance, we cease to struggle against life on life's terms. Striving to maintain and build on our surrender, we are better able to live and enjoy life in the moment. For some of us, deciding to turn our will and lives over to the care of the God of our understanding is a process, not an event. However, in making that decision, we do make a commitment to practice this step in our lives. When we are tempted to manipulate a situation, we recall this decision and let go. When we catch ourselves attempting to exert control over someone or something, we stop and instead ask the loving God to help us work this step. Relinquishing control is not easy, but we can do it with help. With guidance from our sponsor and daily practice, we are sure to find ourselves learning how to get our egos out of the way so our higher power can work in our lives. Each time we are fearful over a situation, we can turn to this step and find the means to walk through our fear without resorting to our old ways. Recovery doesn't exempt us from having to live through painful situations. At some point in our lives, we may have to mourn the death of a loved one or deal with the end of a relationship. When such things happen to us, we hurt, and no amount of spiritual awareness will take our pain away. We do find, however, that the caring presence of a loving power greater than ourselves will help us get through our pain clean. We may find that we are able to feel our higher power's presence in the group, in our friends, or in talking to our sponsor. By tapping into that power, we begin to trust and rely on it. We can cease questioning why painful things happen and trust that. 17. Walking through the difficult times in our lives can strengthen our recovery. We can grow in spite of our pain or, perhaps, in response to it. Recovery is a process of discovery. We learn about ourselves, and we learn how to cope with the world around us. When we are sincere in our desire to allow our higher power to care for us, we begin to gain a sense of serenity. We notice a gradual change in our thinking. Our attitudes and ideas become more positive. Our world is no longer as distorted by self-pity, denial, and resentment. We are beginning to replace those old attitudes with honesty, faith, and responsibility, as a result, we begin to see our world in a better light. Our lives are guided by our emerging integrity. Even though we make mistakes, 
we become more willing to take responsibility for our actions. We learn that we don't have to be perfect to live a spiritual life. When we work step three with an open mind and heart, we find the results are far beyond our expectations. As we experience this new way of life, we begin to realize that recovery is a priceless gift. We learn to trust. As we do, we open the doors to intimacy and develop new relationships. Where once we focused only on not using, we now can appreciate the many things that make our lives so valuable. We savor the laughter and the joy we hear expressed so abundantly in our meetings. As recovery becomes more central in our lives and we internalize the principles embodied in the steps, our view of the world changes profoundly. As our awareness grows, so does our appreciation and faith in our higher power. If we pause to reflect on our lives at this stage of our recovery, we will see that we have experienced dramatic personal growth. The relief we experience as a result of working the first three steps is only a glimpse of the growth we can experience through working the 12 steps. The role of the third step expands in our lives as we continue working the other steps. Step 11 asks us to pray for the knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry it out. Step 3 begins this process. It is here that we start to seek God's will for us. Moving from a self-seeking life to a life based on spiritual principles requires us to change profoundly. With the help of a loving God, we are ready to move forward on our journey. This is a 12-step program, not a 3-step program. The decision we've made in the third step is perhaps the most momentous decision we'll ever make in our lives, but we need to work the rest of the steps for it to remain meaningful. There is more work to do. We have found that the spiritual path set forth in the 12 steps is the only way to recovery in Narcotics Anonymous. Putting our recovery commitment into action, we work step 4. Step 4. 18. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. By working the first three steps, we have formed a solid foundation for our recovery. Our active addiction cannot remain arrested, however, unless we build upon this foundation. As we work the third step, many of us were puzzled. How can we make sure we are really turning our will and lives over to the care of God? The answer is simple. We work the remainder of the steps, starting with step four. Why work the fourth step? After all, we've been able to stay clean so far. But some of us are still haunted by a driving obsession to use drugs. Others find that the feelings of discomfort are more subtle, a nagging feeling that something isn't quite right, a sense of impending doom, or feelings of fear and anger that have no apparent reason. Still others may think we're doing just fine without a fourth step. However, our experience as a fellowship has shown that, sooner or later, members who don't work this crucial step relapse. For many of us, our motivation to work the fourth step is quite simple. We're working a program of recovery and we want to continue. Because our disease involves much more than our drug use, recovery involves more than simple abstinence from drugs. The solution to our problem is a profound change in our thinking and our behavior. We need to change how we perceive the world and alter our role in it. We need to change our attitude. 
Whether our motivation is a desire to move away from our addiction or to move toward recovery doesn't really matter. The fourth step is a turning point in our journey of recovery. It is a time for deep personal reflection. The confusion that we attempted to mask with self-perception and drugs is about to diminish. We are embarking on a search for insight into ourselves, our feelings, our fears, our resentments, and the patterns of behavior that make up our lives. We may be very frightened at the prospect of examining ourselves so thoroughly. We don't know ourselves very well, and we may not be sure we want to. Our fear of the unknown may seem overwhelming at this point, but if we recall our faith and trust in our higher power, our fear can be overcome. We believe that part of God's will for us is to work the steps. We trust that the final outcome of working the fourth step will be the continued healing of our spirit, and we go on. The principles of recovery that we have already begun to practice are vital to working the fourth step. The honest acceptance of our addiction, brought with us from step one, will help us to be honest about other aspects of our addiction. We've developed a level of trust and faith in a power greater than ourselves, and that glimmer of hope we've been feeling is growing with each day clean. We've paved the way to recovery with our willingness, and we find the courage necessary to work the fourth step through living these principles. Honesty is an essential part of this step.